You are listening to Resolve in Reality Radio, the podcast for Ireland's new independent media website, resolvingreality.com. Welcome to Resolving Reality. My name is Emmett, the creator of the resolvingreality.com website and host of this podcast, Resolving Reality Radio. Check out the website for all our social media links and platforms, which you can find in the footer on each page. Follow us on Twitter at Resolving or both capital Ors. Find us on YouTube, where you can listen to the podcasts, but also watch our video content. And don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. We are on Mixcloud, but if you prefer to listen to the podcast in higher quality WAV audio, click on the SoundCloud icon to visit the Resolving Reality SoundCloud profile, where you can download the episodes in high quality as well. Resolving Reality Radio is now on Stitcher and iTunes, plus check out our BitChute profile and you will find all those links right there on the website resolvingreality.com. Ireland, once a place of cultural uniqueness, genuine religiosity and ancient spirit. A place of rich heritage and druidic traditions, the island of the setting sun. Despite successive waves of warping distortions and foreign incursions, the spirit of the Irish remains somewhat intact. Today's Ireland, further warped by the foreign infections of pan-Europeanism, multiculturalism and globalism, is now becoming increasingly ill with the soulless immorality and fanatical chaos that these ideological pathogens bring. The Irish rebel spirit, which burned for so long in the hearts of many, is now being extinguished by new forms of oppression and cultish fanaticism, drenched in materialism, political correctness, faux revolution and docile conformism. This story is not just about the servitude of Ireland, but of the whole world, and its never-ending struggle for freedom from the tyranny of the few and their many machinations. Will this small island, never experiencing true sovereignty, plagued by subversion from without and treachery from within, ever escape the grip of the hidden hand that chokes it still? To resolve these concepts with me is my first returning guest to Resolving Reality Radio, Irish author and researcher Michael Desarian. Michael is a much-respected voice and veteran within the so-called alternative research community and has published many fascinating works including several books about Ireland and ancient Irish history, including The Irish Origins of Civilization, Volumes 1 and 2. This is a follow-up interview to The Real Story of Ireland, my first talk with Michael on the subjects of Ireland's origins, history, culture and sovereignty, and how Ireland has been transformed progressively from a culturally unique place into the typical westernised global state we see today. Visit Michael's websites, michaeldesarian.com, irishoriginsofcivilization.com, and also be sure to check out unslaved.com to absorb his many works, collaborations and interviews alongside his partner at the Unslaved website, David Whitehead. In this interview, we talk about the many factors that have transformed Ireland over the ages and how consistent trauma and chaos have played key roles in keeping the Irish people suppressed. We also cover Ireland's transformation in a global context, the mechanisms of control and the use of divide-and-conquer tactics, including the engineered Catholic-Protestant divide. Also mentioned is the connection between Marxist ideology and Irish nationalism, Christianity and morality in modern Ireland, the new threat of Islamo-communism, and much more. So stay tuned and keep listening to Resolving Reality Radio. Okay, Michael, hello and welcome back to Resolving Reality Radio. Thank you, Emmett. It's lovely to be back on. I really appreciate the invitation again. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, the first one went down really well. It, it was kind of, um, you know, it took a little while to get going, but thanks to your post on the, I think, the, the Unslaved website, it got a lot of hits. And, you know, some people got what we were talking about um, and some didn't. Some were just complimentary, but didn't really get the message. And because, um, of course, you know, it's not just about Ireland, you know, it's about um, control, freedom and tyranny in the world. And, and Ireland is as good an example of any I suppose to to kind of examine this subject and um you know but having said that looking looking at the world from from everything you know of different civilizations and stuff like that can you can you think of a better example of a country that has undergone such changes and over such a long period of time no i can't actually uh we were speaking earlier about you know that the, the destruction of the druids was a footnote and then we even spoke even more broadly about the timelines 
you know, of course, we were focusing there on prehistoric periods, uh, but it's still important. It's still history. And if those have been uh, falsified or deliberately misrepresented, it's, you know, you can start right there. You can start by the misrepresentation of Ireland's prehistory. And that's a huge subject that needs to be looked at. It's not just people in my movement that should be then interested in that. There should be a lot of people, even normal historians, who should be rectifying that. Then we move to that story about even Egyptian relics, not even relics, Egyptian people buried in the soil of Britain and Ireland. Wouldn't you think that people would jump up and say, that is so interesting, it almost defeats other uh Anomalies. This is this is this more an anomaly than the crystal skull, or you know, uh, it's up there. You know, it's a very very big uh, anomaly. But the rest of my research, I actually did say in one piece of writing that it hasn't been even taken seriously by most revisionists, and I just think it's because they don't know what to do with it. You know, I've put together a mass, a whole archive of uh, of these anomalies, stitched them together also in a, in a, a storyline that makes sense partly the dating we talked about and many other factors. But when it comes to Ireland, you know, uh, there's been nothing like the interest, say that Zachariah Sitchin, I'm just throwing out a name as, as an example. His 12 books on Sumeria, these are worldwide bestsellers on spinner racks, but even on a more serious note, people have read these to their great fascination. And that's about Sumeria, Babylon. You know, to me, Ireland is even more interesting and betrays more anomalies. Than, than even Zachariah's work, as great as it is, you know, and it's certainly very interesting when he talks about the Nephilim and the Anunnaki. I'm not taking away from any of the things he talks about. They're all fascinating. But I think that the anomalies that we find in Ireland are even more so. And yet look at the dearth of interest. And that has to be explained. Uh, and part, part of the explanation is indeed a conspiratorial one. Uh, because these Jesuitical forces that we mentioned earlier are still in activity. You can go and prove this. You can prove the lies from the Trinity University all the way up, the desecration of the megaliths and the henges, which is still going on. There's still Jesuit control of Tara right now, Jesuit colleges nearby, Jesuit centers. Uh, the whole of Newgrange it ha has been under uh, a jurisdiction of uh, Mellifont Abbey, but Mellifont Abbey is a Cistercian Abbey, right? Uh, uh, and it's been owned by the Cistercian Templars, that land, that Abbey, that land, and then on that land, for centuries now, is Newgrange. So do you really think that they haven't gone in there and taken away important things and that they haven't scripted lies about that one uh, tomb, that megalithic tomb? They can't hide the astronomy, right, of the sun coming in in the winter solstice. So, But they would have, if they could have moved the planet to make sure that that didn't happen, they certainly would have done so. But never under any, you know, never underestimate the powers of um, duplicity that have also made this journey much, much harder. And still today, even despite my work, uh, you know, it's still it's still uh, way below the radar. You know, and again, I thank you personally for, you know, showing an interest coming along, especially from Ireland. That's quite an anomaly in itself. Yeah. And, and you know, speaking of that, that kind of bias where there seems to be focus put on certain things and absolutely the conspiratorial side of it all, as almost a di distractionary tactic to knock people off the scent of getting to the, the core of things in, in, the, in the world. Um, there seems to be a pattern of, of um, that kind of bias in some ways. And then also when you look at how the control system has attacked certain cultures, and I, I believe that your work has covered um, somewhat the, the going right back, the connections between, you know, other cultures that have kind of come under attack and that have been suppressed, albeit in different ways. For example, the Germanic and the Nordic cultures, the way the, 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 the globalist, uh, wherever you call it, the, this New World Order stuff, seems to be very hard on Germany and the German people and and, um, and Sweden as well. Um, why is it that you think um, does this this tactic of, of suppression against them, like what do they all have in common, these cultures? Well, that's right. It is a universal uh, coverage, uh, a blanket of uh, lies and deception. There's so many reasons for that. It's the same thing we're talking about in terms of Ireland, but but magnified across the board, and there's so many reasons for it. But you're quite right, the Teutonic Knights, who for most of their existence were connected to the Templars, uh, they later broke away and became Protestant, which sort of distances them slightly from the Templars, but to all intents and purposes. And from a occult point of view, they are the Templars. They're just a wing of the Templars. Right? We're talking about the Teutonic Knights. It's not easy to find information on this unless you go to the right books and the right libraries, but they had a, you know, people know in Ireland that uh, Cromwell did a, a 
a burnt earth policy, a scorched earth policy. How many people know that the Teutonic Knights, under the direction of the Templars, but also the College of Cardinals, scourged the whole of Europe? And we're talking Prussia and some of the most ancient uh, sites along the uh, Russian border, you see, and all throughout Europe. You can't even really distinguish because it was blanket. And this is not to even talk about Charlemagne or Constantine, you see, and all the other purges of pagan, what they call pagan, laughably. Why don't we just use the word Druidic and have done with it, right? But this is another another example. Pagan, pagan, what the... And, okay, nobody has a faintest idea what that really... It's one of these vague terms used by academia because they just want a placeholder when it's really the Bardic and the Druidic culture or the Aryan culture, the Arya, who were not confined only to Ireland, Iran, the country of Iran, the ancient homeland of the Persian Magi. That is an Aryan bastion, as it is in northern India, you see. So in terms of Europe, the Teutonic Knight scourge can be proven. Michael Tsar did not make this up. It's history. Study the history of Prussia. Go back and study the history. You know, get a book on the Knights, uh, Teutonic Knights, and pretty much you'll, t you'll see that the Christian uh, leaders, chieftains of these groups, scourged Europe, and particularly Germany. So Germany's been under attack. Uh, I've done work on what's known as the Black Nobility. Now, this is a this is a, normally considered a Dutch group, but actually they only went to Holland after they were kicked out of Germany. They're really German, by the way. They're really from the house of Hanover, and Hanover is a province in Germany. And uh, German history tells us, I'll just mention this very briefly, that they are a, a criminal organization, right? Uh, Germany, especially Prussia, and the king of Prussia, but most of Germany, Saxony, Thuringia, uh, greater Germany, has always thought of the Hanoverans as the worm tongues, as the black sheep, as the deceivers, you know, uh, and they've had a bad reputation. You know who they are now? The British royal family, by way of the House of Orange in Holland, right? So here's a criminal institute. And that's not even talking about the Esther Hazes or the Spanish and Portuguese versions and all the rest of it, right? Just this one house, the House of Orange, which is a matriarchy, by the way, uh, gave rise. Some of their members moved over, you know, in 1690 and took the throne, the House of Orange, with famous King Billy and all of that. And so they bring with them symbolism, which is then very ancient, like a Star of David, the Red Hand of Ulster, all going back to Egypt. It's nothing to do with what Irish people think. And the Southern Republican imagery is very largely the same. And we talked the last time about the purging of the bards, right? Well, of course, that was far, far, far back in time. But this degenerate Black Lodge, this Black, they're called the Black Venetians because they also have connections to Venice, but they're ultimately from... Uh, Hanover, the House of Hanover. And before they got to Holland, they came from France. And guess who they were in France just a few hundred years before? The Merovingians. What's this to do with Ireland? Well, the Merovingian elite were taught by the Irish Chaldee monks who sifted through all the Druidic connections. So wherever you turn, right, the power elite of today, be they British, Dutch, German, Venetian, whatever, they're an international family, even going to Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Spain, Portugal, right? But this group, once you start following it, and I'm glad to see there's been some very good books on the Holy Grail, you know, there's fam famous ones and not so famous ones. That's another tie in there because it talks about a very important group in all of this called the Priory of Zion, which definitely exists, Sion, S-I-O-N. They're a core group within the Knights Templar. The, the, what we call Knights Templars and Cistercians are just sort of the outer lodges of a very sinister organization, uh, you know, the Priory of Zion. So these are the steering committees that then have so much to hide. If, one, if their identity is discovered, their ancient origins, and also because they have had a worldwide campaign to suppress the Arya, the knowledge of the Arya, because they've got it, they're wielding it, they're working on it, they, their whole knowledge and traditions are based on it. So the real thing has to be purged. Constantine did it, Charlemagne did it, you know, the Merovingians and Carolingians, they've all done it. They've all suppressed the great pre-Diluvian knowledge and gnosis. Yeah, and the um, the like when we spoke in the first episode, we talked about the beginnings of that story, and then you were just covering there the different facets of the same agenda. And of course, when, when we look at Ireland, it's like the 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 most famous and often forgotten about, I think, as well among many circles, especially the politically correct circles, is the uh, the effects of, of British imperialism, which was a you know a, a, just another kind of tool of of the Atonists or. or or whoever is anti-Druidic, basically. And, um, you know, we, it wasn't the first invasions. We had the Vikings in the 8th century, uh, eighth, at the end of the 8th century, sorry, you know, Dublin, Waterford, Wexford, and we had the, the Cambro-Norman invasions in the, in the 12th century, aided by some, you know, some of the Irish lords, I think. And 
But I mean, you know, that is quite a long time ago. Um, but do you think that kind of marked the beginnings of the end for Gaelic culture in Ireland? Or, or, you know, do we have to go further back than that? Well, it all depends because there's been, just like in terms of Britain with the Anglo-Saxons, the Danes, there has been invasions. So that the question of invasions is very interesting because, and just like you mentioned, the Vikings. Okay, take that one for an example. Right away off the bat, you can immediately see there's a difference between two kinds of Vikings, pre-Christian and post-Christian. So the Viking of pre-Christian Europe is a very different creature than the one that comes after and has signed on for Christianity. You know, people like Charlemagne gathered together 4,000 or more of these uh, pagan leaders of Europe and wiped them out, just like a big Frank Nitti, you know, Al Capone massacre in France. So when they took out, yeah, they actually brought them to a big feast and killed them all. Here's your Christian potentates, you know, the wonderful guys, right? They killed off all the major chieftains, the ones they knew wouldn't bend. And then when they were taken out, then the rest of the tribes fell rather quickly because it's gone to the head motif, you see? So the same thing happened in Ireland. You're quite right. Even in later ages, like the 12th century of the coming of the Normans or even the Romans earlier than that, each of these waves have been for conquest. But behind each of these, what my theory is, is that behind each of these waves is the same uh, ultimately Merovingian hand, you know? And so that takes us into who are these Merovingians, which then opens up a vast story that is, you know, tremendous. And then I, I tell that story, you know, but for our purposes, it's just important to realize that the Merovingian dynasties were patterned on the Druidic. Not because they loved the Druids, but because they had appropriated, you know, their teachings. Uh, you, uh, the, like, for instance, you know, the Templar capital, Champagne, Burgundy, right? The Bur Burgundy, the very word, is actually from Denmark. Burg the Burgundy Celtic tribe, right? This is a Celtic Nordic tribe from Denmark, completely uh, evil, completely ruthless. You see, because these are spurious groups who have no uh, national territory. They've gone beyond that. They've, they've basically sold their soul to some darker power, you see. And so... They, they struck out on their own. So how many people know that, that this Burgundians of Hugh de Payens and, you know, the Count de Champagne, all of these people who were, who were funders of the, of the Merovingians and other secret societies, and as I say, ultimately leading to the House of Hanover and then the House of Orange, these groups originally, you know, had ancient pagan pasts. They were Celtic. Many of them were Celtic. You know, the word Portugal is from Cale, C-A-L-E, Porto Cal. And the Cal were a Celtic group. So the whole country is still named after a Celtic group, the Belge, who eventually came over to Ireland as well, right? So there is this prehistoric uh, connectivity, which is really my fascination. As things move up to the Gales, you know, which we already pinpointed was about 500 BC, and that date is debatable. But even if it isn't, you know, we said earlier that the followers of Akhenaten, my theory is that, you know, they came about 1000 BC. And that's controversial enough because that's not accepted. But you know something? To meet people halfway, what even if it was 500 AD? Who cares? Uh, BC. It really ultimately doesn't matter. The fact is when a tyrannous group has taken over and sets up shop, that's your worry. That's the issue. The dates is more of our scholastic, you know, argy-bargy and debate. The fact of the matter is deeply evil people are now in charge of the world order. That's the, you know, what Michael Zarn is mostly focused on. But in order to deliver that message and get people, you know, you have to uh, present them with uh, academically founded facts. And But here's the weird thing that when people like me speak, when the world keeps telling you, provide us with facts, when people like me provide you with facts, nobody pays any attention because I don't have a PhD in a suit and tie. So that's not my duplicity, that's theirs. If you ask me for something and I provide it and you don't accept it, the fault is on yours because every single, you, you won't find a lack or a dearth of citations in my work. In fact, people have kind of criticized the work because there's too many citations, can you believe it? There's too many, I mean, where have you ever heard of that? First, they're telling you, give me facts, Michael, this sounds a lot of like a hocus pocus nonsense. This is all mumbo jumbo, all right. I jam packed my books full of citations from eminent archaeologists and what have you, and then still uh, turn your back and uh, turn their back on you. But the fact remains: there are the facts collated, cited, backed up by the top academics in the world. So now you're, the egg is on your face, not mine. And yeah, like you know, I thought uh, when we when we you and I talked last time, I actually wrote down a couple of points. If I can just take a minute to read them off. 
And it'll help galvanize, especially for people who are new, but even for people who need a refresher course on this, who, who have been studying these matters. There's a couple of great errors. I don't know, there's about maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight of them, and I'll just list them off if I may, Emmett. And th this could be a good yeah, no worries, know, point yeah, to yeah. jump off from, or just, just to remind people of where we've been going. Because in the great process of history, be it Irish history or world history, these are going to matter. But I'm really thinking of Irish history, the history of the Northwest, like you said, places like Germany and Scandinavia, right? So the first great error, and this is of academics, not of people like us. This is of people who have bought a lie, who purvey a lie, and do not tend to uh, heed or even unbiasedly take on board new information, even if it turns out to be absolutely dug up out of the earth. You know, real fact, like those ships and those faience beads that were found of Egypt or the Barbary apes in Navan. You know, I didn't, I didn't make them and hide them there. They're, you know, they were dug up, all right? So the person who still remains in absolute resistance, then it's because of these seven or eight facts. The first one is the great error, myths are disregarded. And we covered that extensively last time. So myths are disregarded. Then there's a, inclu included in that uh, is the pre-Diluvian civilizations. So the mass man walking around today isn't like people in this movement who openly minded accept that there was civilizations before the rise of Sumeria, Babylon. That's that's earth shattering to most novices. It's, they don't know what to do with that. What what do I do with that, right? Well, I don't know what you do with it, but you you know, or do you want the satellite photographs then of the Saraswati and Ganges River where they show there's settlements there with millions of of inhabitants? I didn't make them. I didn't fake those you know, satellite photographs of the land bridges and all the rest of it. So what you do with it is your affair, right? Three, the age of catastrophe. To me, this is a really big one because it ties in with the fall of Atlantis or if you prefer the Arctic homeland, but just a simple age of catastrophe. The evidence is worldwide. I think we touched on it uh, last time when I mentioned that the National Geographic within the last 10 years has done coastline readings of all the coastline shelves of Britain and it's 100% proven catastrophe, not uniformitarianism. There are high, high HD cameras, the, the billions have been spent I've got links, but it was air, it was scrubbed, of course, it was airbrushed, you didn't hear much anything about it. Well, all right, but if it had approved uniformitarianism, my God, every, every you would have heard it from pillar to post. But because it proved the absolute opposite and vindicated masters like Commons Bowman, where there was hardly any follow-up. But I've got the links to the original, you know, on my Irish Origins of Civilization website. Next one would be, say, the migration of the elements of civilization. Somebody would say that's the paramount one. Because it turns out that that migration of the elements of civilization did not come from the east to the west originally, but from the west to the east. One of the great central theses of my work. And the ones I've just mentioned so far, right? The myths being disregarded and pre-Diluvian civilization, peace, or the age of catastrophe, the fall of Atlantis, and then this migration of the elements from the west to the east, not the other way around. Well, it's earth shattering. People would rather sign themselves into a madhouse than accept those because it shatters every paradigm that is out there in the vast corridors of the mainstream. And if you've been encased in cement in those theories, which you shouldn't be, there's no reason to be. But if you are, which most people are because they haven't questioned, they don't ask for contrary evidence and they never ask for alternatives. It has to come to you from Mavericks or it has to come through the movies. Then you'll accept it because it's now the right brain working. And maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later. But the thing is that just to accept that one one, this first, uh, this one, the migration of the elements from the west to the east, uh, will change your worldview 100%, and you'll be an immediately, you know, everything that you've learned from the mainstream is now highly suspect, just with that one alone. Following on from that, then you have the returns theory, that I am not saying that civilization elements did not at later times then return to the west, like say from India or Egypt, or the move from Troy, you know, and all the rest of it. And uh, that would tie in with the L.A. Waddell's theories of the coming of the proto-Celts, you know, and the Gales and all of that. There's a strong theory there of a movement from the West, sorry, from the East to the West. We even have one of, of Trojans, you know. There are all those theories, and I accept them all. Because how could you not? Somebody listening to us right now saying, Mike, that you don't make sense, because how can you admit in one voice that all the famous uh, migrations to Ireland or invasions to Ireland, the ones that are classically mentioned in the Book of Invasions and that are known to every mythologist, you know, the children of Parlothan, the children of Nemed, the Tuatha Dé Danann, the Firbolg, the Gaels, all are, except with the, with the exception of the Tuatha Dé Danann who came from the West, and that's the big red flag right there. But in almost all the other cases, going right back to Césaire, the first one, 
it was a pseudo uh, sort of a quasi biblical female character at the very first invasion you know, at the time of the flood coming from the east how can you say that ireland is, is you know you accept these invasions and you're telling us to accept them even though they're mythological and then you come up with this theory from the west to the east see it would sound very confusing wouldn't it no i accept those but I accept that they were later migrations. What I'm talking about, about the first migration of the elements of civilization, are in a pre-Diluvian period that has been scrubbed from history. But as we're saying now in overview, to try and download that simple fact in the people's lives who have become extremely biased is already a monumental task. The Commons Beaumont and Ignatius Donnelly, Anna Willis, Connor McDory, many people have tried this and it fell on deaf ears and it lapsed. And so people are still buying into the, the beginning of history coming from these uh, classic invasions, you know, from the East. And there's a whole other story. But then moving on to the last three of these uh, little bullet points, I think the other one will be the rise of Judeo-Christianity. You want ignorance squared? Start there. Everything one knows about the rise of both Judaism and Christianity is false. Those two religions could not exist without Druidism in both its Irish, Western form, and its Persian form. You could even add, you could add a mixture of Chaldea and all, but let's leave all that out. You're Egypt, my God. But let's leave those two out. Just Persia, right? The Magi coming to visit Jesus. All their symbolism that's loaded into the nativity is coming from Persia. And, and, and you know, I could talk for hours on that. So the rise of both Judaism and Christianity, I've written books on it, Trees of Life, Astrotheology. In those books, it shows you that I'm right, that those elements come from those two sources. So there alone, the ignorance of anyone you shove a mic in their face and say, tell me about the origins of Judaism or Christianity. Everything they're talking about is nonsense. They don't know about Hebrew. They don't know about what the word Jew means, where it really comes from, what a Levite is, you see, and all the rest of it. Then the next but last penultimate bullet point I've got here is uh, anyone's account of the destruction of the Druids. We talked about this last time. A footnote. Here are the aria without which none of the traditions, even architectural, civic, judicial, right, the, the Brehon laws, far predating the nonsense that Britain concocted. You were just talking there about the British establishment. Yeah, you think Brehon law was it was what they wanted? When the you know one that's completely fair and doesn't subjugate anybody and treats everybody as an equal. There's no exploitation from any overlords with Brehon law. Because the High Druid will make sure that everyone is treated as a child of God. You think that that's coming down from, you know, that's what we have in the British judicial system? My goodness, no, it isn't. And then the final one, which I wrote here, and there's many more, but these are just the ones to, for, you know, people to really delve into. And that is that uh, the architecture of post-Diluvian, right, control. So this is where it becomes deeply conspiratorial, because no one can understand the architecture of modern control without factoring in prehistory, and nobody does. And I mean that, really, nobody does. If, if some people are doing it, it's purely anecdotal. You know, pattern about, go back to Tipi or something, you know, and writing very, very mainstream, uh, publisher-friendly books. Good, nice, nice, yes, yes, that'll, conv that'll convince a few, you know, middle-of-the-road people, like I've been saying. But ultimately, you need to do a lot more than that. There's whole questions of the origin of evil here, the psychological control over the mind, which nobody deals with. Well, well, well if you have an age of catastrophe, that has already traumatized the essence of one's psyche worldwide. World control becomes, you know, easy. Spectre, number one and his cat, can handle it because the victim is already utterly throttled with fear and trauma and anxiety. We touched on that. So those are just a few bullet points that the academic world, and I go so far as to say that unless every single one of these errors is corrected, you're going to be dealing with comatose people who have no grasp. I don't care how many degrees they throw at you. To me, they're infantile, because this it's, it's in these few little points I've made that the real history of the world lies, and it's the real one, the vivid one, the one that casts back the shadows of deception. And this is, this is really, you mentioned a few times there that this is really, and you said it many times over the years in your interviews that, you know, the bottom line is this is a war on consciousness and it's a suppression of real spirituality and a great technique 
um, you know, looking at Ireland and how it was a sustained um, suppression, um, you know, they obviously had many tools in their box and the British weren't the first, uh, the empire wasn't the first monster to ever kind of, you know, oppress anyone in the in the earth by any means. But um, they used certain tactics in Ireland, you know, and over such a long time. And we can talk about, say, the plantations and stuff later. But even if we look at, um, you know, I'm skipping ahead in time here, with, with the, you know, stuff like the way things are done, like the slave trade, for example, which is something isn't that isn't talked about a lot. When when you put people in slavery, you kind of you um, immediately have them be sub subjugated, and it, it kind of drains the self esteem out of people. So, like, what's your thoughts on that from a, a, a psychic control point of view? Well, slavery is in many forms, isn't it? Um, there's the physical version, which of course goes on to this day. I mean, you know, you can't even start talking about the child abduction and the white slavery that's still going on today. But the slavery that I am concerned about the most is the one that is uh, of the mind. And once you have enslaved the mind, then you have enslaved the rest of the psyche, uh, the psychosoma. It all follows, you know. But the interesting thing is that that's evil. And therefore, we then it moves us into understanding what is evil and how is it, you know, from the day one I've said, Know thine enemy, which is advice the Bible gives. Nobody's following that. But if you did, and you say, hey, know thine enemy, then the next part is like, I would say, add to that. And the weapons that they're using. So you can countermand it. You know, and one of them, of course, is our natural, some of them are natural pro proclivities. We touched on it a little bit earlier on, that all those bullet points that I mentioned there, you would just be pulling teeth, as well you know, to make even one of those facts. Uh, come to the table just as an open discussion without people going to the boil. And yet, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, right? Oh, national treasure, I love it. Uh huh. Right. So, isn't that the controller then using your right brain? Ancients did it by giving you it in mythical form. I love that Illusinian stuff, you know, especially the part where they take out their knives and slash. You know, the male child or whatever, you know, dismember the Osiris or Tammuz or I love that past, brilliant. Right. But that actually happened. Oh, did it? Right. There's there's already cognitive dissonance within our own mind. You know, the wicker man. Oh, I just love watching that film, you know, with a wicker man where they burn up all the people. Like Hammer House of Horror can hand it to you. Right. But. But the uh, book of fact, that's just nonsense. Right, the atrocities of the world are a footnote. Right, yet we're watching it in forms of you know uh, a movie on the Knights Templar on a great Armageddon, on a great Christian battle like El Cid, you know, and we go for that. We don't realize it's happening right now. So already within the brain, there's a schism. You know, so not, again, it just brings back to what we said earlier. Nothing to what I'm talking about is unacceptable. It's just that we accept it on the fictional level. For whatever reason, uh, when we suspend disbelief, that all, that all we can do, and the controllers make use of that, because there's nothing that I'm saying that the pieces of it are not out there. My job has just been to collate it in a sensible, rational, factual form, right? But I didn't do it within the walls of a disgusting Jesuit college, did I? I didn't do it in Trinity University or Queens. And because of that, I remain an outsider. You know, I've even named, on Sunday you're coming on to my podcast, we'll talk about your life, experiences and I named that talk, you know, the outsider in Ireland. And and that's is very, very appropriate because that's what I am and I assume that, you know, partly that's the way you are, if not even not more. And there's others listening to us who also feel that way. They've had this stay stum. They can't speak. Of course this is a case all over the world, but they can't even show their family and friends what they're reading. But if they were to present it in a fictional form, say, or a poetic form, let's say, or they made a little movie, everybody would just go, that's an act of genius. That's brilliant. That's stuff about Atlantis. I love that. You know, it's Doctor Who version. Then, the, the, then all the magical, you know, all the magical think is acceptable. But if you present it in a non-fictional way and start talking about these things as we are doing, you just don't, you know, you just, you just can't make it. And yet, as I said, we talked about last time, you know, Spanish and Gaulish, that's French, ancient mariners spoke openly about Ireland being the holy place. That's actually the term that they use for it. When James I arrived back from Scot uh, arrived back from France to England, and he did so as a Knights Templar, by the way, you know, because they're connected to the Sinclairs and the Declares and a lot of other groups, right? But when King James himself was on board the ship, he says, I'm returning to my home England. I'm returning to England, Scotland, the promised land. 
Now what? This is 1603. They believe the myths. They know that Ireland is a blessed land. They know it's called the Fortunate Isles for a reason. They know where the pillars of Hercules are. They want their coronation chair over the Stone of Fowl, which came from Ireland. Right? They want all the regalia and the symbolism. They're the Gales. They're the descendants of the Gales. But what, what, what does that word mean? Do you know it turns up in Sumerian, meaning navigator, ship, shipman, world traveler? Probably relating to the Phoenicians and, and related tribes like that. The Gauls, like Donegal, right? And all the rest of it, Portugal. You see, it's all about the etymology. It's all about tracking it down. We said last week about the Oli, oligarchs. Oli is the high druid, right? Ari, like aristocracy. Where does that word come from? What does A-R-I stand? That's the druids. What is knob? When we say, oh, he's, they're the knobs. The nobility, nobilis, right? From nobilis, meaning Gnostic. The noble, no, nobility is the g nobility or the Gnostics, the ones who know, the wise ones of old. It's in our language and we're blind to it. See, we have cognitive dissonance. It's incredible that, oh, that the, the overlords have manipulated our own minds, our own psyches to blindside us so that we don't see what's right, what's there in front of us. But my work is to help people to train themselves. Why is there that Star of David on the, on the Irish, Northern Irish flag? What's a red hand doing? Where would that come from? Do you know it's, a, it's the tutelary symbol of the Pharaoh? Pharaoh Aya? Anatnast Pharaoh? That was his, that was his, yep. He used to wear red gloves and in and, and the hieroglyphics. You can still see in Egypt, he has that glove over his knee. That was his beloved symbol. What's it doing on the O'Neill clan in Ireland? Well, there hangs a tale. The same tale of why King Menes is buried in Tyrone, why Scotia is buried in, in uh, Kerry, why Jeremiah is allegedly meant, meant to be interned over there at, uh, you know, on the west coast near Tara, and Tia Tefi and all the rest of it, those Barbary apes at Navan, and all the other things, you know, that I've dealt with in my work. They cannot be thrown aside uh, because there's an incredible tale there. But... I will not allow, you see, the point I'm trying to make is I will not allow people to write that off as ancient history. Well, well it's fascinating anyway, but it's just ancient history. What's that got to do with us now? It's the architecture of control today, right, is entirely based on it. So if somebody wants to really know the full reasons for the architecture of world conspiracy, you've got to, you can't just talk, go back to the beginnings of Christianity. That's pathetic. And that's what most people are doing, or they go back to, you know, a date reasonably recently and trying to look for the causes of it. This thing goes back to the dawn of Persia. This thing goes back to the dawn of, of, of uh, you know, of Irish history. But nobody else has tracked it from there. So if a Zacharias Sitchin does in Sumeria, he, he's carried through the streets. You know, laurels are thrown on his feet. I'm, I'm just doing the same thing and not for the same results. I don't give a damn about fanfare. I'm just doing the same kind of research to bring Ireland's history and, and prehistory, you know, to the world. But what, But I'm already far more aware of what kind of resistance you know will be there but i deal in this i specialize in the john allegros right you know in in the uh, uh commons beaumonts and those people because i didn't kick this i didn't kick start this work off they did and i'm just carrying it on you know the the you brought up the the red hand of ulster having the the uh going right back to egypt and stuff like that it's typical you know hidden in plain sight stuff um, symbology and you know I've always wanted to ask you as well about the whole you know the more stereotypical um, repackaged uh, kind of fake um, stereotypical symbols of Ireland you know and, and say the St. Patrick stuff I've always wanted to ask you you know the, the allegory of him being um, uh, apparently banishing the snakes what was that a reference to like the um, the dragon courts in, in druidic times or was it more of the kind of the lucifer and the serpent in the garden of eden side of thing which one of those was there, or was it something different i think it was the first that you mentioned because it wasn't just that anecdote there's other anecdotes in the story of uh, not just patrick but columba and the other ones as well uh, in which you can clearly see that this is monkish terminology nomenclature largely you know using a bit of symbolism which you have to give them a bit of credit for even though they're Servants of evil in my eyes, but you know, they're, they're already on their way there using symbolism because the serpents are undoubtedly the Nadreds, who are the Druids. So it's a stand in word for the Druids. And even they used it in the Book of Kells. They couldn't have, see, it's like the proof of what I was saying when the monks 
plagiarized and cannibalized the earlier traditions, they couldn't help using some of it. You know, it's like you put your hand into glitter and some of it sticks. Right? Yeah. The fragrance of the work, the fragrance of the archive of the Druids, which goes back millennia. That fragrance, they say, there's an old Indian proverb that when an axe strikes a sandalwood tree, the axe comes away smelling of sandalwood. That's what I mean. But never should we then say that this originated with Christianity, that fragrance. It didn't. It originated with what that the tree, the holy tree that they cut down. But, it, that, but, the, but people like me know how to smell that forensic evidence on them. So in their illuminated manuscripts, like the Book of Kells, in various of their anecdotes and stories, is the old echo from millennia before. Uh, when you hear about goddesses, you know, like Bridget and Anne and, and all the rest of it, the ones that were Christianized, there's the echo, right, of a much earlier goddess cult. And that still continues, you know, all the way through to today. Very little has actually changed. Uh, when you look at the modern cathedrals, well, not modern, but I'm saying historical cathedrals all over Britain and all over Europe, there, there isn't one that wasn't built right on top of a Druidic center. This includes Chartres and Gizors, you know, and, and all the rest of it, all the ones uh, that we know in Durham or Salisbury, uh, that kind of thing, right? Uh, Westminster Abbey and all of these kinds of things. And then in the symbolic way I'm talking about, the new architects preserve the truth in their stained glass windows and in various other motifs in the new Christian cathedrals, like say St. Paul's Cathedral, the floor there. And the, so it's a black, black sun here and a star there and another little uh, spiral here and a little uh, zoomorphic motif there or a 12 rayed window here. They're, they couldn't resist this. <laughs> they're trying to scrub it and airbrush it, but they couldn't because there's something so magnificent about what they had taken that they couldn't even resist lions at the front of a stately home a fountain here, right? And I've been all my life, starting with Belfast City and that, there, you don't even really need to go much further, by the way. If you really know what you're dealing with, that city alone is, is enough. But of course, one extends it, right? But they didn't just steal, plagiarize, cannibalize. They had to incorporate it almost from day one. So the robes that they wear, the scarlet that the cardinal wears, right? The various robes that the other potentates are using, the whole nine yards, uh, is coming from this uh, much more uh, ancient. And then when it comes to the, you know, somebody like, say, like the Teutonic Knights or the Templars, and then later the Masons. Now, the disguise factor is, that ah, looks Jewish, and that's where most people stay. And I, I go, look, yes, it is Jewish, but where did the Jewish symbols come from? Oh, I have no clue. I, I don't know, they're Jewish, right? Just, just, just Jewish, right? Middle East. No, the word Levi is a Gaelic word. All right, that's it. You just stun gunned that person, right? Right. All the 12 tribes of Israel, mate, their symbols are Gaelic, you know, from Ireland, like, end of conversation. Nobody even asked the simple question, where did the Jew, you're asking where the Christian stuff goes, well, that's the Jews, the Jews, right? Well, where did the Jews come from? Sure, it's not important. And that's, there's that cognitive dissonance. See, but to me, it was important because I could see the antiquity of these things. They don't, they don't just come overnight. And other great, great scholars like Lawrence Gardner agree that the mathematical tropes, my God, something as simple as just basket weaving, let alone higher mathematics, that built the pyramid. I mean, that obviously tells, to this day, they can't tell how those sarcophagi were made. Right, right, then let's get on with the game. Let's start asking the questions, where was the antique pre-Diluvian civilization? So they crawl, Emmett, they crawl one inch a century and then give themselves massive congratulations on that. But, but the evidence from all these cultures tells a massively different story. And as, as well, you know, it's the layers of bullshit we have to sift through to get to the truth. And, um, you know, when we're talking about Ju Judeo-Christian religions and, you know, Ireland, you know, Ireland has been traditionally known as, you know, a Catholic, a Roman Catholic country. That's been the dominant religion. And has also been the dynamic of uh, Protestantism, of course. But both of those are imports you know, neither of them, um, you know, to those of us who understand it goes back to solar worship, astro theology going right back. Both of them are constructs. One is a split from the other one, but both of those have kind of dominated this, the Irish story for hundreds and hundreds of years. But, um, you know, am I oversimplifying this or, or what's your take on it? No, 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 no. Because the strange thing is that uh, we're dealing with a ransacking of a culture. Now we see that in the British East. See, say you say, say you said about uh, what are these characters, these conquistadors going over to Mexico, 
and you tell them what you did to the Aztecs and the Maya. Nobody, nobody raises any finger. Go, oh, that didn't happen. Because everybody knows it did. If you talk about the British East India Company going over to India and, you know, ransacking the country, so to speak, right? If you talk about De Beers and Cecil Rhodes going down to South Africa, you see, and ransacking the diamonds and the gold. Nobody, when is the last time you anywhere heard get up and dispute that? They never do. These acts of colonialization are on record. They make, they make up part of the history of our world. These, these, you know, like you said, the slave trade in Dublin, first run by the Vikings, and God knows what was going on even before that. That is on historical record at Trinity University and everywhere else, and any decent Irish historian knows all about it. Right? So these, and, and in fact, even the invasions we touched on of Ireland, they were invasions. They were acts of conquest. Then you have the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes and the Danes coming over to England, active invasion. That's why the Welsh are always considering themselves the real Brits, right? Because allegedly the Britons went sort of into Wales, uh, you know, uh, to hide out while all this was taking place and everything, right? So all history is an act of suppression. But never, but in Ireland, it's, it's, it's worse because of the overall, right, meaning that Irish culture would have meant. You can't have uh, the story of the area traveling to the West. You can't let, like we touched on last time, where one of the top archaeologists, Professor Alexander Tom, discovered that the earliest megaliths, and they happen to be the ones in Ireland and Britain, the earliest ones are the most precisely geomantically aligned. That one fact not only vindicates Beaumont and myself, it absolutely transforms what a person knows about the world. That one fact. They'll be head scratching till there's no head left. How, how can we be brought up listening to the, rat, the rubbish that we're taught and then go out yourself with the same tools that Professor Tom and others have done, right? And there's a whole appendix on this in the Irish Origin site. I think it's Appendix 2. Uh, and you can read up on it, uh, recent discoveries. And it will prove to you this point. Well, how then is somebody like my father, you know, we used to take us to picnics and he was a materialist, atheist, Marxist. But even he used to stand up on occasion and just marvel at these huge stones, you know, ones we go to near down Patrick or wherever, right? Let alone the ones down in Newgrange, my God. And he just had no answer. Now, if I was to hit him with what I was learning later on, say he'd have lived and I'd have turned around and go, here, uh, we go at one of these picnics and I happen to hit him with that, that these are more more aligned. We know this because every, every December, right, all the illustrious names from uh, Dublin go up to Newgrange for precisely that reason, to watch the sun and the moon coming in, or at least the sun... You know, but the moon does it in those three nights to look at that sunlight going in. Well, that's point. my point is taken, that all the Irish megaliths are precisely aligned, these hinges, even really primitive ones. Right. But they're more precisely aligned than any in the world. But they're the earliest. There goes all your 15, 18 years of study in traditional colleges. It all just goes out the window. And I did not invent that. That's a fact. That's only one fact. And you can take that. Then you say, OK. The tower, right? The great round towers. They're the same round towers that were discovered. And these are earlier than the monkish ones. The monks have took credit for building because they did build some. But the pattern on which they built them was an earlier, right? Like, like the famous one on Tory Island. But you find those in India. You find that in the story of Nimrod, right? Building his Tower of Babel. Tower of the Many Languages. Oh, well, that, does that connect to the Gaelic colleges of Phineas Farsa, which were known as the mystical schools of the many languages? Well, I guess not. It's nothing to do with that. I'm sure. Look at that. Look at that. That's, that's lunacy. Yeah, well, Nimrod. R-O-D is like Roth, meaning red. The red king. The white-skinned red queen, red king. Semiramis. The, uh, one of her titles means uh, the, the, the golden-haired one. And on and on it goes. Right, So this fountain of knowledge to which pharaohs were returning later on, an emphasis on return, the pharaohs were returning because everyone knew what the Blessed Isle was, and it was Atlantis, right? It was part of Atlantis at the very least. And Atlantis itself, look at, you don't even need more than a word. ATL is really a, a sort of a der derivation of ADL, Adelantis, with Adel being ADL is the same as what we would now use as ELD, Elder. So elder, right? It means the elder one, like an elder man. So Atlantis is really right, the ancient land. Instead of ATL, it's ADL from the word meaning old or old. The old world, the old land, the place of the wise ones, right? Hyperborea, Tula in the Germanic tradition, 
or the Arctic home, I just make it real simple, the Arctic homeland. People balk at the word, you know, Atlantis. You can just say, look, it's 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 a great civilization, you know, uh, that was destroyed in the north. Uh, the evidence washes up all the time, you know. So Lemuria, these places, there was a pre-Delivian civilization, Atlantis. And that's where a lot of it comes from. That's where a lot of the evil comes from. So, you know, factoring in these prehistoric uh, stories will help make a great, make, make things far, far easier. But as I say, the, the myth-mongering that makes, you know, the audience not know any of this started very, very early on. Because, like I said, I give a little star to those monks, but really they don't deserve anything more than that because they already started this myth-mongering process. The first invasion, the one at the flood of the female Kasser, meant to be Noah's daughter or something like that, or a granddaughter, that's fake. But that, that's the myth-mongering that already tried to say that the first um, appearances, the first traversals to Ireland were at the time of the flood from the east. That's why that story is interpolated into Irish mythology. Because Ireland has to be a naked country, nothing. In fact, the whole West, remember the whole story, you fall off the edge of the West or it's the other world of ghouls and ghosts and, and all of that. The other world, in misty lands of the, of the West. That was all put in because these lands had to be naked in their prehistory. They had to be. You couldn't accept, you couldn't get the ball rolling of conspiracy and tyranny with any other story. And so the monks then, realizing that invasions had happened, they were sifting through all this druidic knowledge basically, uh, you know, tossed it up and brought it back down in, a, in their own way with lots of elements of truth, but distorted. And so the story of Kasser, uh, you know, relative of Noah, coming at the time of the flood to a naked island with nothing's on it and forming the first population, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense, right? Nonsense. But so, so as you study these things, you start to get to realize what is just absolutely false evidence, right? Uh, like criminals planting evidence to lead you astray. And the gems, and I alluded to one earlier on, the Tuatha Dé Danann, the Tuatha Dé Danann, they are the red flag because they're, are, they're the um, tribe who came from the West. Well, there's nothing out there, right? It's the Atlantic Ocean. What were they doing? So people just cognitively dissonance and move right on. Don't think about that one. But the story that comes into the Tuatha Dé Danann, which has often been very, very misinterpreted on purpose, deliberately, and it's mostly been held in limbo. Nobody wants to talk about it. They're the mythical ones. They're the fairy folk. Uh, t tell my kids at bedtime story about it, you know, the banshee and all of that. And, and we'll just leave it there then. Where's the Guinness? <laughs> yeah. The the layers of bullshit like we were talking about. And, um, you know, it's when I think of the uh, one, uh, we'll never know, but I suppose if you left the Irish people or indeed any group um, alone in their land and let them have a connection with the land, you know, free from external influence, wonder would they normally just revert back to their natural connection with the land and their original culture? I suppose, like I said, we'll never know. But, uh, you know, in, in Ireland as well, then as time went by and they started to create divisions, like you said before, to cause, you know, trauma and mayhem to keep people distracted and you know talking about that the the christian um catholic protestant dynamic i brought up um you know they brought in um protestant colonists into part of ireland like like empires tend to do and they put these people are very different in close proximity and you have that kind of um design uh, sorry um conflict do you think that was always part of their plan or is that something that just happened because of you know martin luther and henry the eighth and all that oh well when you take away it, 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 the normans had been the first to do it because you have to go to look at the statutes of kilkenny and other penal laws and that's been scrubbed from the internet by the way um Sadly, I lost a document, you know, from my computer that had this information many, many years ago, and I've never been able to really re uh, recompile that. But I can say an overview that if you, the details are, are just horrific, right? So the Normans are the ones who really started, and then the British government, you know, uh, followed suit. And believe me, they were in collusion. I'll be doing podcasts uh, in the future, or not podcasts, but premium presentations, proving that there was collusion between Henry II and Adrian IV, you know, the Pope. So again, on paper, where there's meant to be this a great antinomy and uh, antipathy be between crown and gown when it came to Ireland, actually that's another lie. Both at the Norman times, in Cromwellian times, and also in, in, in at the time I just spoken of it, Adrian IV, uh, Breakspear, this these Illuminati families, these black nobility families connected to the Merovingians, you see, these people have had only one 
agenda towards Ireland, and that is divide and rule. And they'll divide religion turned out to be the most successful. But believe me, they tried it. They tried it in other ways. They tried pitting the different clans against each other. When the when the when the bards were destroyed, and the Christian Chaldee monks started to advise the kings, you know, during the, the time of the Gaels coming, which is the real fall of Ireland, actually. Uh, then they already were, you know, working like worm tongues to pit one chieftain, pagan chieftain against a non-pagan. How do you think the Brehon law was destroyed? So they uprooted all of these traditions. But then the one that you're speaking of is, of course, the most classic, famous one. It still goes on really today, even though it's sort, sort of buried. But it ran amok, uh, courtesy of the Jesuits, who have a stranglehold still. All that, all that really has changed is that now the Jesuits are more powerful in Northern Ireland. The so-called anglo irish Agreement fiasco is just with the Jesuits, who had great, great power in the Republic of Ireland, right, but qu couldn't quite get into the North as much as they wanted. They used the soft approach through the SDLP groups uh, and through the Workers' Party and all that. And then they had their extremist groups, you know, in various groups like the IRA. And they even had even more in the INLA, the Marxist group, the all-out communistic Marxist hand, right? And the Jesuits have world known to be communistic and Marxist. So I'll let people, you know, connect the dots for themselves. And so you either have a little nonviolent group or you had a very violent group, whatever. But it was all tentacles of the same hydra, right? Cap headquarters in Dublin, headquarters in Rome. They've actually been in touch. They've been, they've been, they've had action before. Right, they've had well mean these would be more well meaning types on, on the Protestant and Catholic side, say back, you know, 100, 200 years ago. Say you're talking the 1700s with your Thomas Russells and your Theobald Wolf Tones, right, and Henry Joy McCracken and, and the United Irishman and this. They've tried various benign versions of this. You'll see the same pattern in Prussia, you'll see the same pattern in places like uh, France, where it hasn't all been revol violent revolution, it's not all been even. Negative in many ways, right? See, if Ireland was just a socialistic country in the say the shape that say James Connolly wanted, I probably wouldn't have a problem. I really wouldn't, right? Because I don't, I don't uh, condone violence, and I don't, con you know, condone secret societies. But if if the vasses of people voted sanely for say a libertarian or socialistic thing, okay, we take it from there. I'd be on record as an opposer of that, and I would just in you know through writings and speeches and whatever you get on with it. That's sane. That's that's a healthy society. But when you've when you've strong armed people and twisted their arm and butchered and murdered and bombed all your way up to in, mostly innocent people, or people who really have nothing to do with this, you know, then then of course that's unacceptable. So this is what the British government wanted: divide and rule. They know what the Irishman's made of. They know he'll fight back. They know he's a warrior. So they knew that the more frontry that they can do, you see, uh, you know, the more that they'll probably have a reaction. And then there's the whole argument that even the Sinn Féin and the IRA have been actually funded by British intelligence. So there's actually more evidence for that than you can imagine out there. Uh, I write about that in my article, The Occult History of Ireland, in which people like, uh, oh, what was his name? The great uh, patron of the early IRA. Name is, escapes me now. Oh, he was he was eventually ha hanged, but he was a knight He was a knight of the Garter. And, and some of them were knights of uh, St. Michael and St. George. I mean, if that doesn't tell you volumes, I don't know what does. But there's plenty, anyway, just to make the point, there's plenty of uh, evidence of collusion, right? Now, the thing, but even if somebody finds that too hard to swallow, right? Back in the time of the ancient order of Hibernians and various other secret societies, there was sort of a benign movement to liberalize Ireland, right? Now, I look at that as a, a campaign of mind control, right? That didn't work. So then, you know, further, further, other groups became more and more and more violent. The original, even official IRA were largely non-violent, right? I wouldn't agree with their policies, but at least you'll admit they're non-violent. Moving on then, the provisional IRA becomes violent. You see, that'll get the headlines. That'll make them look like a legitimate uh, rebellious, uh, power-seeking revolution, therefore aligning them. We sort of spoke humorously about that last time. You know, that they then can align with the PLO uh, ideologically with the you know, ANC and various other groups that appear on the surface to be anarchistic and looking for freedom. And of course, nothing's the case. They're all funded by British intelligence. You know, uh, Sir Roger Casement was the man I was uh, thinking of earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so he ran them, right? He ran the early IRA, brought them guns in. And they claimed that one was blown up. And I think it was uh, Carlingford Lock. Yeah, but that's only the one. The man had been bringing in successful armament for, 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 for a longer career. But the, of course, that's you know suppressed. You can't find that stuff out. But this man worked for the highest privy councils. And what on earth are loyal Irishmen, if they're meant to be Republicans, working with a senior royal 
appointed Knight of the Knight of the St. Michael and St. George. You see, these are the things I look for. And they're not the only ones as well. Right? And and even the United Irishmen are connected to the Illuminati, a more of a benign wing, but still a revolutionary one, still one that when it gets these well meaning little younger men, you know, these ideologues, and of course there was atrocities. Of course there were atrocities. Of course, you know, there are three of the great patriots was uh, you know, Patrick Pierce and uh, Daniel O'Connell and people like that. So there have been legitimate, this is the crazy thing, there's been totally legitimate Irish revolutionaries. I'm, I'm, I'm with them. I believe in them. I, even, I have a, many stars for James Connolly. But of course, James Connolly was shot down, shot down. And Michael Collins was shot down. Patrick Pierce was shot down. And Daniel O'Connell died in agony in Greece after being exiled from his own country for fighting the Vatican. Because all the things that are in common with the men I've just spoken about is they knew who the real enemy was. And they didn't mention the British crown. They mentioned the Vatican. Now, what are you going to do with that in your pipe? All the ones who never mentioned the Vatican and the priests, they lived to become the world famous. Give me a soapbox anywhere in the world and I'll get up and I'll do my act. But the very ones who knew that who the, 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 the black robes, every one of them was shot and exiled. Now you tell me that's not fact. Daniel O'Connell, his life story alone, Patrick Pierce, Michael Collins was onto it when he knew that the, the IRA was being run from underneath by British and Oh, he just got assassinated. Sure, the car broke down. There was, happened to be bandits on the road, just shot him. Only him. That's how it works, mate. The, the moment you find out you've been had, they get rid of you. And that's the policy you see that's been very focused on Ireland. Other places are even, they've been treating like this, but much more lenient for some reason. Don't know why. Ireland has always been in the crosshairs. You know, and it's a tremendous study to actually find some of this out. But, uh, you know, whistleblowers have also said said things, you know, and, and once you get used to it, then you can understand. And you I, like, just like I've done now, you can make logical uh, uh, differentiation between what looks like a well-meaning socialist. Right? Well, you might disagree with ideologically, but nothing more. Because you can uh, side with them. You can say, look, I understand what you're doing. There have been atrocities here, and you're trying to fix them. And they go, that's it, all I'm trying to do. I go, well, what's wrong with that? But we're not dealing with any more of this, uh, you know, well-meaning socialism at all. That was used as a capsule. That was used as a capsule. You know, for, for, for infinitely more sinister uh, colonization. So we were talking about the... Um um, the different facets to all of this and, you know, the confusion with Ireland and how all the, the different ideologies and the difference between real rebellion and fake rebellion. And do you think that the um, the whole, it's almost like if there's a rebel intentions to be rebellious, that they kind of, they can be so easily diverted into these kind of cul-de-sacs, you know what I mean? So we're talking about like, say the concept of Irish freedom, you know, in principle is a good thing. And there was people who knew the difference between the real thing and the fake thing and who the real enemies were. But if the control system is chucking these ideologies like Marxism and stuff like that into the mix, it kind of, you know, it takes that rebellious energy and diverts it down into these, you know, cul the sacks where where real freedom isn't achieved. So, you know, what's your thoughts on that aspect of it? Well, of course, they know that. Why have? Oh, well, it, it, to me, it's always been that. It, it's not that they can't use the. You know, belligerent, all out, gun to the head, conquest uh, program. They have used it, but I think that something happened. You know, probably after the Second World War, although various ideologues, you know, uh, had tried to advise more subtle Orwellian, you know, programs of control, but they were shouted down by, you know, the old guard, right? Who just believed, look, just send the troops in, all right? Just slaughter and hang and incarcerate. But this, this, uh, was this, this group finally died off. And I touch on this in a, presentation I do called the dying conspiracy and it's just to point out that look a conspiracy doesn't the techniques of conspiracy largely stay the same in agenda but in practice it can change you know and so they want the remote control uh, victim somebody who because of his appetites or as you say because of he feels he is a legitimate enemy 
or whatever, right? It is bored. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I've even speculated that uh, the leader's job is often to manufacture enemies based on his advisors telling him now is the time. People are boiling over now, so let's go, right? You know, and the leader, part of the leader's job is to lead us in the direction of an enemy, right? So, but ultimately speaking, what better way, as pointed out by Aldous Huxley and George Orwell, is just to make the individual either so affluent that they, that becomes a drug, you know? Or so much of a simulation, uh, uh, probably the better word would be the artificial. Put them, in, make the environment of the animal, right? The species you're on, that you seek to control. Look, just put them under, or put them in an artificial environment. You know, so they've tried this and that. I mean, they sit there in the, ta you know, the Frankfurt School throwing darts and they've read, they've read Hegel, they've read the masters, they've read the great sages and geniuses, and then they've plucked their work. So when you talk of a Marx, this Marx is a, is a hyena, right? Who just tore off huge chunks of Hegel, threw out all the metaphysical, beautiful stuff, right? And, and, and uh, boiled it and boiled it and boiled it until finally something showed up at the end. This monstrosity, right? We call uh, Fabian Marx's, um, you know, dialectical, what the materialism dialectic i mean i could barely bring myself to even say it right preposterous nonsense but you shove it into some tweed wearing lunatic at the front of your class some bearded trotskyite son of a bitch right and then and you put and you clone him or her right and then you put them in all the academic positions and you give them give them a little house you know and you give them a little car and you give them a little red book they're happy and they'll go in and teach 36 kids the more most bogus crap, knowing full well that nobody at the back of the class is going to hold up a Hegel and go, uh, but actually, no, he didn't say anything about that. That's it. You're, you're failed, right? So if you go to Oxford and Cambridge, they screen you. I have top professors from there admitted that the smartest people have ever come out of Oxford and Cambridge got seconds and thirds, meaning fails. The firsts were all the people who knew how to jump through the hoops. I've got their teachers admitting it, that the firsts, these are the ones who go into business, go into government. The first is the idiot who just repeated what he was told. The creative minds are the ones who get the seconds and the thirds. And that goes for every single collegiate and every single university on the face of the planet. Everything has an exception. But in this regard, you, there probably is no exception because how could you be an exception? You'd be screened out the moment that you're saying anything that breaks the consensus, you see, or doubts, doubts the consensus, you will be penalized at some point. You'll be assassinated or they'll tick you down or they'll even take you aside and say, look, we need to, you know, some of these ideas you're writing down, we can't, we can't pass that. And so they'll, they'll just train you like a sheep. And so that's what mostly you're seeing. But as I said, getting back to your question is that, look, it's much better to not have troops on the streets because then that gets a guerrilla warfare situation, which you might need at a certain point of history, but when you don't need it anymore and that war game's over, now it's not good to have that. And also you need obedient workers. If I'm being searched three, four times, walking into Belfast City, if I'm disgruntled, if I, you know, then I am not, no, I'm not good enough of a worker. I Give them, give them some honey. Give them some uh, uh, sugar instead of salt. Right? Give them chains of iron instead of chains of gold. And that group has now won out. So what that means is that in the West, conflict has been a lot less. Right? Uh, there are exceptions. But really, on the whole, the conflict is less. In the East, it still rages because those guys ain't sophisticated enough, right? We are real sophisticated. We sit in our cubicles for 40 years and say nothing, right? We vote on the box for the next set of tyrants, you know, imagining that they're going to really, they really care about us and all this stuff, right? And we sit down and obediently watch the sitcoms and the soap operas in which all the multicultural nonsense and all the other uh, male and pale is bashed into stupidity, you know, made into a mockery. The father figures are just utterly under attack. You know, we believe it all. None of it has a shred of truth. Demographically, it makes no sense whatsoever. But who cares about the facts? Just carry on. So the colonization of the mind, it's this more Orwellian, Huxleyan way. You know, and, and of course, that does include dr uh, medication, happy pills, drugs, you know, because, oh, sugar. Sugar is the biggest drug of all. Look at the weight problems that people are having. That's, that's sorrow that causes that. You need sweetness on the tongue because your heart is full of pain. You know, and, and, and so people who are deeply rent inside on a psychological aspect compensate by, you know, the sweet foods and the big gulps and whatever else the big society is handing them, you know. But even that, they pull the rug. Smoking used to be the way that people, you know, calm their rage. 
Well, now then they pull the rug from under smoking. See, they just play with us. It's this constant playing with us. You know, uh, who, who brought in the ale houses? Who brought in the liquor? Uh, and w what's the history of that? I'm going to do a presentation tomorrow. It's connected to the priest to the illies. Because even the word ale and ul in, in, in Scandinavia has an incredible uh, history going back to the gods, the ones on the hill who need you inebriated, who need you walking through the streets like a drunk, walking through life like a drunk. Oh, yeah, there's there's a whole physical aspect to this. And, and it's incredible when you get into it, our spirits and alcohol plays a role in this, you know. Just in a general consciousness um, point of view, analyzing the human race from a consciousness point of view, we're, we're still playing the same games here that's always been played. It's just the techniques have changed. And, you know, we were talking about the, you know, the last episode about the hard boot in the face communism and how things are done differently nowadays. Like the ultimate uh, aim of the control system is to keep people suppressed and keep them in a low you know, level of vibration, a low level of consciousness. And they've changed how they've done that. And Ireland, again, like we said at the start, it's as good an example as any of what can be done to a place and what magic can be weaved on the psyche of people. And, um, you know, like I mentioned in the last interview as well, people are walking around talking about diversity, multiculturalism, equality with these big smiles on their faces. And they've no idea that they've been indoctrinated to think this way. And of course, it, it comes from the universities. But, you know, we talked about Marxism, but also what about what about um, think tanks? You know, I mean, uh, what about the role of, say, well, we mentioned the Fabian Socialists, but you've got the Frankfurt School, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, Yale. Like what role do they play in kind of, um, you know, um, adding new tools uh, into the armory and uh, for the controls, new uh, mechanisms of control, should I say? Well, that's a huge thing because if they pick up some kids in school who are geniuses, but they're, you know, they're psychopaths, they need to be able to join a Bilderberger organization. You know, see, there's many tiers to this. It is pyramidical, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who brought them ideas that they didn't have 50, hundred years ago. When they meet an HG Wells, when they meet an Edward Bernays, they, they, they need, they need that, you know, and there's a George Soros, right? They need that guy to open his own sub-institute, hire people. His ideas are great. We love it. You know, people before him didn't quite have it together. Frankfurt School is the same. And by the way, the Frankfurt School is by no means full of all evil people, right? But there are evil people there and they're evil ideologies. But by no means are they strictly that. It's just a think tank, right? And they bring in ideas from everyone. And you may join it and you may say, look, you know, I got these ideas and you don't know where those ideas are going to end up, right? This is Spectre, so you don't know, you know. The person working for them thinks he's working for, not in, you know, international imports and exports, right? Or I'm an expert in sociology of a certain country. Or I'm a historian, or I'm, a, I'm studying ancient languages. Ever seen that movie, Three Days of the Condor? Robert Redford, get it out, watch it. You, could, you think you're working for a library. And all the time you're working for something else that you may live your whole life and never even understand where your work is going to end up. They've whistleblown this enormously because as I say there's many, many tiers of this. And they are smart enough to realize there's intelligent people down the line of the pyramid, but they have really, really great ideas. Well, how does that great idea then you know, find its way up the, up the ladder? Because it's not all coming from the top down. Some of those guys are thick as shit and they're psychopaths. So there's some ways that they can't think, right? The real controllers need a sort of a human element. The psychopath is, is good for certain things, but not good for others. Wow. And remember the human race, yeah, the human race is made up of many different types as well. And there are also many different races and nations and cultures, right? There's different classes. And so a, a plan, a paradigm, right, that works for, say, a working class group, say, in England, is it not going to work in China in the same way or in Africa, right? Uh, and so on. So they have to modify. And they have, sometimes they have to do this on a hair's breadth, you know, really, really fast. So there's quite uh, an operation here. So when people like myself speak of these societies and what have you, we're trying to keep it simple, you know, so that the person can then, if they're interested, then they move on to study. Okay, I'm going to study these Jesuits, uh, Michael. You know, I really focus in on that, you know. And, uh, and then this thing, the red papacy, you know, how does that work? You know, or why are they different than the College of Cardinals? You know, why, why do you have these conservatives over here and then these extreme leftist Marxists over there? And the Jesuits have always been in, in touch with them, you know, Ireland being one of their big capitals. So what's that all about? You know, uh, how did they move to socialize the world? Uh, what is what is their uh, missionary work to go to the darkest parts of the Amazon jungle or the Congo, 
and take some semi-savage people and give them Jesus. You know, what was that for? And what the hell is really going on there? Who funded that? You know, and all this. So it starts moving from there. And, and interesting, interesting, you know, and again, you, the symbolism is often cross swords, cross keys, you know, like there's a divide and rule, uh, the, the open compass. You start, start, you know, the black and white squares. And then you, you take that up to the next level on the political level. You see the conservative versus the liberal and you start to get suspicious. You don't just buy into it. Or like I was saying earlier with you that there seems to be this Dionysian element that appeals through movies and ad copy to the right brain, helping us to accept memes that we'd normally completely keep outside. Right? We'd never accept. It wouldn't, wouldn't be part of our lives. Sir Bourbon Man would just go, no. But through the Guinness advertisements, the cigarette advertisements, you know, all the rest of it, then the commercials, then the magazines, there's something being spent to us and then through the movies, as we alluded to earlier. Now, somebody up there in those Tavistocks Somebody in those Frankfurt schools and Chicago institutes now knows how to work on the limbic area of the mind, or like I said, on the right brain. And and through the music industry, my goodness. Oh, and, can, and then they, they get so good at it, then they stamp their own brand logos on the T-shirts and on the Madonna, on her stage set, and Beyonce and Lady Gaga. They're actually stamping it practically on their foreheads. She works for us, you know, in the T-shirts and the pyramids. They're now they've gone ape shit because they're not even hiding it anymore. You know, if people watch my Age of Manipulation uh, series, they'll they'll see this incredible story that they're they're even so blasé now about it that they're even saying this media, right, this modern popular media is under our control, and still people don't get it. They don't connect the dots. You know, it's a good thing I don't care to speak to the rest of mankind. If I did, I would, I would sign myself into a mental, you know, madhouse by now. Because of the you know the extraordinary resistance of the audience, but I came in knowing, you know that uh, it's only going to be for a small select group. So I'm I'm not bothered about like other people are who chew bricks, you know, over this whole matter. Yeah, the, it is, and I'm sure the controllers and the occultists laugh when uh, people are so slow to catch on to things, and they'll just keep pushing it further and further if people don't react. So those of us can see this stuff happening and can call it out straight away, but you'll still get that massive chunk of the population who doesn't have a clue that they're being programmed. And you know, we're, we're talking as well about how the the control tactics can change from country to country, and this is something I wanted to ask you about because you know we both know what Christianity is, we know where it comes from, like thanks to your work and the work of say, you know, your Jordan Maxwell's and, and people like that um, someone like me can understand it. Ha having said that you know, I think that because of what's happening to the Western world um, with the, this new cult of progressivism, which is really Satanism, hidden this, you know, covering uh, with a different mask on. And I actually find myself, I'm not pro-church, I'm not Christian, I'm not pro the Vatican, certainly not. But if, if there is any sort of moral teachings in Christianity at all, um, I kind of find myself wanting to defend those, you know what I mean? Like where the church is happens to be opposed to a lot of things that the new, this new liberal or progressive cult um, wants, wants to happen. Like, you know, abortion, uh, gay marriage, um, uh, th the list goes on, um, uh, monogamy and stuff that the church, you know, stands up for, for things that the progressive camp is against. So do you think that Christianity still has some sort of a, like a moral value in Ireland, given the, the circumstances? Uh, of course it does. If you read uh, Ecclesiastes and many other the works in the Bible, you know, you, how could it not be? These are magnificent works. As I say, a lot of it is coming out of an earlier tradition. I must add that, the Druidic tradition and the Persian tradition. It's not, it's not, nothing's unique to Christianity. But in the context you're talking about, absolutely. And I'm, I'm all in favor of, uh, uh, you know, a priestly person. And there have been, there have been some, and there will be others who stand up and really show the fall, the falling off, you know. If anything, I feel that they've been too socialized and there's not enough of them standing up this way but uh, there are there are those voices you know i think even president trump in, in his own way you know is doing that so there's there's never going to be complete silence you know and i myself am a highly ethical person and therefore i can easily as i said as i said before one has to differentiate between the good and the bad and so any bastion any establishment that is traditionalistic in a sane and rational sense i'm, I'm for that group you know, whether it's in Judaism, which is strictly moral, or real conservative Jews are even infinitely more, you know, uh, moral than even the average Christian. So 
one sees this and and is very very. I'm not a Christian myself, and I'm you know don't have any of these uh, orthodox religious beliefs because I don't believe in belief. I believe in knowledge. But outside that, since we have to have something that appeals to the masses, and if they can't find the, their own will within to do their conscience then maybe they need that fatherly icon. And this is something that I actually have been touching on now and again in various uh, podcasts in which, you know, I have a strong feeling that the father figure in whatever form is going to be needed to offset, to, to, you know, insanity and also regression, psychic regression. So one who sees that as Freud himself saw, you can't really knock it, you see, because it's something that we have called up from within ourselves. It's not something imposed from outside. The child, the infantile, when we talked about this ancestral cataclysm factor, well, how can I ask anybody else to accept it, like I did earlier, and I myself then don't accept it or, or forget about what its implications are. Its implications are that if we've been ancestrally traumatized, and then in modern times we find ourselves being constantly traumatized, then obviously the father figure, that iconic, you know, imago, is needed. Now, it just matters what shape and form it comes in. And you're talking about the ones that are there traditionally. Well, yeah, I've read Julius Evola. I know... You know, I, I, I've studied this as well, and I do see that in a state of almost pathological, you know, circumstances, that fatherly figure is essential, whether it's in the shape of, say, a god or, or, or a leader. And also what I'm really looking to then is the morality factor, you know, uh, that comes with that, because that is ultimately a set of psychological boundaries, you know, and it's definitely something that I would prefer to see. What I'd really like to see is conscience, but... You see, we're in a state that that's too much to ask for, isn't it? So, yeah, maybe the other, you know, when people are inebriated, intoxicated in, in so many ways, it, it's very, very difficult to, to ask them then from within, right, to, to get in touch with their conscience. It really is difficult to do that. Yeah, exactly. I love this stuff. I, this is what I'm all about as well, really, at the core of is the psychological end of things and about real morality and real justice. And I, I agree as well that, you know, it'd be great if, if everyone was a real sovereign where they themselves have a conscience, they know the difference between right and wrong and they, they treat other people well and all of that. But you're always going to get that big chunk of the population who needs to be let. And, you know, if, if there's no one in that role, something else will step into the vacuum. And in Ireland, case and uh, maybe like with a lot of um, Catholic countries who are being turned away from Catholicism um, you know it, it, it was part of the ethical makeup of the country for so long and in Ireland's case what's happened in recent times is you can see with the media and with, with the with the states doing where all these organisations popping up that are pushing all these progressive agendas that it, the church is obviously the obstacle you know, in so many ways. And it's interesting to see what's going to happen to people. Like I said, if you remove the, the, that one form of ethics and an ethical structure for people who need it, it needs to be replaced with something else. So, so I, I think really what's happening overall is that it's mad that people are happy to see the back of the church now because of so-and-so, you know, crime or corruption, but but they're actually wel welcoming in this cult, which is w even worse, which is going to take us backwards in terms of morality, but they, they just can't see it, Michael. This is the big problem. These are the greater, like when you pull back from the canvas, these are the bigger issues, you know, that very few people deal with, like about the psychological, you know, and <clears throat> religion plays a big role there. Uh, because it speaks of the mystery. It speaks of the mystery that's higher than man, you know, uh, and this can have an, a great import. But at the same time, then, if you dig deep in, in some of these conservative uh, people, these ideologues, they will then, you have to watch out there too, because they might then try to instill or advocate a rigid sort of caste system, almost hierarchy, you know, which which won't work as well. So, because it, and it won't work just because of the age we're in. There's been so much libertinism for so long since after the Second World War that any of those conservative voices, well-meaning as they are, are just going to be laughed out of court. The churches of all churches have been over, you know, taken over, ecumenicalized by this uh, Luciferian group. So it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, you know, and so because I'm not an expert on that, I, I just try to advocate on an individual level for people to have spiritual insight and a consciousness. And morality is seated within anyway. You see, the, the when we say the word conscience, you are saying something that is the fundamental seat of of a morality within someone. We all know what is good and bad, except the psychopath. But we live in a culture where the psychopath, you know, often is promoted to 
senior positions within the hierarchy. So there's a lot of complications there, but it's not that they can't be destroyed, they, you know, taken down. They will be by knowledge when people are able to identify these wolves in sheep's clothing. But the good news is that because in most people, that most people are good anyway, and that seat of conscience is inside, then the journey becomes pretty much like what I've been doing all my life, which is to try and uh, bring it, bring that voice, make that voice louder. And to do that, you need to get into psychology, you know, uh, and then find out what is the difference between super ego and conscience uh, and all the rest of it. Start looking at the great psychologist's work. It, it's not, it looks like a lot in the beginning, but it's really not. And it has the, the greatest implications, as you know, because it, it starts uh, answering things for people you know, on a, on a very deep level. Yeah. Yeah. And you got it. There's the, that no one can do this work for the individual. They have to go and do it, do it themselves. And, um, uh, I'm just thinking as well as we're kind of coming towards the uh, the end. Um, you know, I remember you brought up in the last interview um, the the concept of Islamo communism. Now I kind of been trying to guess at what this is, and I deliberately didn't look into it so you could explain it to me. But I have my ideas of what it is. But but what is this concept of Islamo communism, Michael? Well, this is essential to the where we are right now, and it, it's very much rooted in, in in things that go back to the Second World War, but even earlier. It's very much rooted in the in the need to destroy Germany, which is an ongoing thing, right? But now it's just sort of uh, expanded out because Germany, remember, had allies in the First World War with the Young Turks, who were Islamic, right? Uh, progressive Islamic, but Islamic nevertheless, right? Uh, so what's all that about, right? So this, this has tremendous roots. But uh, yeah, I've done several podcasts on it. I recommend people go and listen to those. Uh, pick up the works of people like Chuck Morse that we've had on. Uh, interviewing on the subject. We're pretty much the only station that ever touches on this. You'll find that very few people are not up to speed at all on this. Uh, but I specialize in, in works of this nature because when people today see that what they think is Islam is on the rise, this is faulty. This is, this is flawed. Islam is not on the rise. Islamo-communism is on the rise. And that's a whole different entity. Islam on its own, without any uh, funding, and without any goading from behind, right, wouldn't be threatening the West. Uh, so the story then unfolds from that point that due, after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, but even before, again, a small group of ideologues, mostly in the Red Papacy, mostly Jesuitical, but others as well, you know, not aligned to those two forces I just mentioned, but even even hardcore communists who now realize that the hardcore Bolshevik methodology, right, wasn't working. But far more Fabian types of Marx. So Mar Marxism, socialism has always been divided into the Bolshevik hardliners, you know, which you still sort of get in China, a much more draconian kind of communism, and a lot more Fabian, suit and tie, you know, H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, you know, uh, Bernard Shaw, you know, the British Liberal Party. You know, a real soft, smiley face. Sneaky. It's becoming more rabid now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, with these Soros's and Cortez, it's, that they are the Fabians, but they they're again showing what they are. In other words, the wolf, the sheep's clothing is a little bit slipped, and you're seeing the wolf. You know, after President Trump's uh, coming to coming to the fore, right? But imagine for a minute that wasn't the case. Then these Fabian types, they always realized that this hard Bolshevik type wasn't working. And then they were proven right after the fall of the hardcore Bolshevik, you know, Eastern Bloc, the Iron Curtain come down about 89, 90, right? So then this group started to be listened to a lot more. And this is coinciding during these periods from the First World War onwards through the second and up to today, the Vatican itself was losing its right wing conservative, you know, uh, slant. Some people say this is because of infiltration you know, by, by Masonic groups, you know, that's a whole separate question we can't deal with here now. But the, the fact remains that the red paper, what I call the red papacy, right? A much, uh, a communist group, but with, with incredible tactics. And you saw this during solidarity, you know, the Polish solidarity in the 90s. And it was there with these uh, cardinals, Jesuit cardinals in the Reagan administration, Cardinal Spellman, and everybody should have been asking, what on earth is a ostensibly right-wing conservative president doing hobnobbing with the, the, the black pope, leader of the socialistic Jesuit. Oh, nobody really asked those questions. Right? So, so, but the thing is that what happened was this left wing brand 
of Catholicism, if you have to use that term, this left papacy, they made massive, massive inroads, both into the United Nations, you know, and then because of solidarity and Pope Paul II, John Paul II, throughout the world. He was hailed, wasn't he? He was kissing the ground everywhere he went, right? Uh, he was he was a big star. And then you're, the rise of Bono and this Geldof creature, right? And all the rest of it, they unleashed their, their, their pinkos, right? All over the world. And they got them into the best positions. But another thing that happened also was that there had been this alliance after the Second World War, after uh, Germany was defeated, that there was an alliance between the communists and the Islamics, the Islamic world. It practically happened, it happened in practicality because remember Hitler himself met the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Otto Skorzeny and many other of the top Nazi brass were, spoke Egyptian, spoke Oriental languages and had lived out there. And we had very, very strong connections with Arabia. This is an incredible story, just like Britain did actually. Your Lord Kitchener's and all, they were out in the Sudan. They were, you know, Lord, Lord Gordon. The British did it as well. They, they were out in the East, but the Germans were out in the East as well. I just alluded to the fact that Germany was an ally of the Ottoman Turks in the First World War. How did that alliance take place? Well, we don't need to get into that now. We just, I'm just noting that there was an alliance. So there has to have been already something in common with certain Western powers and left-leaning communist groups like the Young Turks in the East, in the Middle East. So these are stories that have never come to light, that, you know, they're never dealt with by people in this alleged movement, right? But they're absolutely fascinating. Now, after the Nazi, once you understand one key thing, fascism and Nazism is socialism. So it wouldn't make sense if I said that fascists from Germany, as everybody understands, I'm watching all those World War II new pictures, and the John Wayne, you know, extravaganzas, you won't get this because the Nazi is the Nazi is the Nazi. That's all you need to know, right? But no, Nazism, National Socialist Workers Party, well, let's try and decode that if you can. It's not that hard. They are a brand of communism in the same way that you had in Italy with Mussolini and you had a stronger, more malignant type under Stalin. But that's that's the double tea bag. There's a single tea bag version. There's, there's, commun there's Bolshevism light. It's called Nazism. Now, when those Nazis were annihilated and wiped out, the leaders of those, the real ideologues, had already had connections with the Grand Mufti in Egypt. And unbeknownst to the West, they already had huge connections to Saudi Arabia, you know, Iran, Palestine, you name it, right? Syria as well. So to cut a long story short, after the Second World War, we get bedfellows in the form of uh, Communists from Germany, from Europe, both from Russia and from Germany, meeting with and, and becoming blood brothers with extreme radical Islam groups, right? And they formed this Islamo-communist group that's been building and building and building, and I've been tracking it for years, right, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, they're deeply anti-Jewish, and they are the ones who broadcast for years, as they have done, all this anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish propaganda that everybody's familiar with. This movement's uh, jam-packed with idiots who've fallen for it. This doesn't exonerate Israel, by the way. Right? Just in case the people are pulling their hair out. No. Israel's done its fair share of obscenities, but I'm, not, I'm, kind of, you know, I'm showing the bigger picture here. Vast amount of propaganda has been unleashed. Pro-Palestinian, pro-Arab, pro-Turk, all the rest of it. Now, you can, you know, you can look up a thing called pan-Arabism, you can look up a thing called Pan-Turkism or whatever, right? The CPU, the Young Turks of the Ottoman Empire. You know, I've got so much information on this. That's why none of this got produced. There's so much of it. I've barely been able to touch on it. Our interviews on, you know, the subject of Islamo-Communism are a initiatory attempt. The ones we've done, maybe four or five. Those are just scraping, the, you know, they're just opening the door of a subject that's massive. And I have still... You know, we've got Amir Tahiri, Paul Williams. I've got stuff from so older sources that clearly show you the truth of this matter. But, but you know, so far, we've only been doing on slave for about two years. We've just opened the door, barely, to show that it's not Islam. It's Islamo-communism, a different hybrid that people need to know about and worry about badly. And they're behind a lot of the atrocities that are done. And their ideologues are so unbelievably wealthy and powerful. Now, this meant that they actually physically moved to the Middle East. Many of these ideologues I'm talking about were so disgruntled after the fall of what they thought was, you know, their their first attempt through Nazism to have a United States of Europe. It didn't work. 
Now, Merkel, May, Blair, right? Whoever, what you got, right? These are disciples of Islamo-Communism. Merkel has already been seen in her childhood walking in communistic marches, right? But it's Islamic money from a group that is known in the East, but no Islamic person has the guts to stand up and reveal it, but although they're enemies, right? Uh, and this is why there's difficulty then where you will find animosity between different Islamic groups, like you know the Shah of Iran being replaced by the Mullahs and the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Syrians and the Palestinians and the Egyptians all not liking each other. And this is one of the reasons, not the only reason, I'll be, I'll be doing a podcast that brings out all of these internal rivalries, which a lot of Western people don't know about, how much they hate each other. You know, we know about the Sunnis and Shiites and all, but that's, there's so many other reasons why they hate each other. But the simple reason why they hate the West, I mean, anybody listening to us can work out. Communists hate the West because we're capitalists. Islamics hate us because of the, pretty much the same reason, but because we're infidels. So they found great commonality, right? Uh, uh, to take down capitalism, to take down Western civilization. This is what they colluded in, and this is their agenda. But with the extraordinary money that they have, plus they're armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons from Putin, what a wonderful guy he is, everybody should love him, yep, he's in the media, he's a popular guy, right, but they don't know that he's in with these, uh, 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 he's in with the uh, Russian Muslims, what are they called, the, uh, oh, why, why is that name? slipped my mind right now, the Chechen rebels, excuse me, right. He has given them millions, if not billions of dollars of old nuclear weapons that, you know, the, the, Rus the Ruskies used to have. They're in the hands of Islam now. <laughs> Hope that makes your day, right? They've learned how to miniaturize them. I can't remember the professor's name, who's a, the expert in miniaturization. He's from Pakistan, he's a Muslim. And him and his team, and they have open door to Gaddafi. Gaddafi was his best mate, and he's, he, this this professor is a best mate he's from Pakistan. Can't remember his name right now. He's in charge of the. He was in charge before he died of the entire uh, Islamo-communistic military, and they'll bomb their own people. They'll annihilate Iranians, Syrians, Lebanese, anybody who stands against them. They'll kill them off and assassinate their leaders, right? And they'll go rapidly after any white white leader. So this is the group now that is primarily uh, served. And some people say, well, is, is it George Soros or, you know, are the anti-Trump people, are they being funded by these guys? And the answer is yes, through South American banks, right? Because the Islamics are now very, very powerful in Colombia and Mexico. Uh, they've spent billions there to prop up leaders who appear to be, you know, Argentina and Venezuela or whatever it is. And really, the whole countries are Islamified. Mexico is on its way to being Islamified. And so the money comes in that then tries to affect the politics of, uh, you know, of North America and Britain as well. And then we have the invasion, uh, emptying emptying the sump, you see, of, of uh, Syria and everything. That's part of it too. But that's funded by these Islamo-communists. And this is a subject that people should start looking into. It's really, really interesting. Uh, we're going to do a lot more work on it, as I said, down the line. But this collusion between these forces also has another tie-in. Because somebody will easily say, I can prove to you, Michael, how many collusions there are between, say, Jewish money, power, and Western leaders, you know, conservative and liberal. That's on That's on paper. Everybody knows, right? Uh, but I'm saying to them, yes, now what you've got to study is the similar, similar collusion between Saudi Arabians, Islamo-communists, right, Islamic forces, and, and other leaders in the West. But with this caveat, it's more powerful. And it's older. So these are two facts that will, again, people just go reeling, right? Older? Yep. The Jew hadn't had the power in America, anything like the Islamist has had, but you didn't know about that. And there's more money involved. These are the two things you have to download. It doesn't exonerate any of the other stuff, right? Uh, but this is a, a, a new piece. And I'll be working on, you know, presentations that bring that out to show how the collusion started between uh, Western leaders, who the leaders were. And this inc includes the royal family of Britain and how they have Saudi money, how those collusion. You, you remember the time at the 9-11, you saw Bush, George Bush walking around with books on Islam. and He was holding the hands of the Saudi sheikhs and the Carlisle group was found out and Halliburton was all found out to be deeply involved with bin Laden. This is all what I'm talking about, but it's just giving background to that. Those anecdotes. Luckily, came to the surface, and I was glad for it. And there's great books like House of Saud, 
you know, I'll be referring to those books in, in due course. Th this did emanate to the surface, but nobody still really connected it, right? What, what has to ha under be understood now is what I've just been saying, that Western leaders, rather than being collusions of Jews, in the, in the sense that people would accept that, oh my God, there's something going on on world affairs that far transcends that. It includes some Sabbatean Jews, but it's opposed by the most of, of most of Jews. But you won't hear that, right? You just won't hear that because you're not reading the right stuff. You know, you, people aren't studying the right stuff. So the real threat of the modern world is Islamo-communism. But how it shapes and takes its form in the West, you know, that definitely needs to be explained and brought out. And, and, you know, and that's the work I, I'm doing right now. And we'll have some really good stuff on that as time goes by. But people can start with the podcasts on Unslaved, you know, on that subject of Islamo-communism. Just type that into the search engine and, you know, all those great interviews will come up. Hmm. The, you know, just as you mentioned Merkel there as well, I thought, what a coincidence. Well, I knew about uh, Angela Merkel's communist commie background. And um, obviously, when you look at what's happening with Europe, and when you said Islamo-communism, for me, the kind of penny dropped in a certain way, but especially when you're looking at mass migration, because it's clear that there's the, the, the Muslim element in Europe is increasing because of the migration factor. But Angela Merkel, uh, you know, literally said, come on in. To, to Africa and uh, and the Middle East and uh, that's interesting if she's colluding I mean if Islam you know we think to try and explain to an ordinary person who's willing to see it what evidence do we have that Islamo-communism is real well when you have one group spreading uh, that that's a very communistic it's it's all about world dominance at its core and if you throw the Islamic extremism you know kill the infidel side to it you have you know um, Europe filling up with a Muslim element who also is anti-West so it's it's kind of not that much of a leap really when you look at even just the mass migration agenda on its own that's right and as I said if people are familiar with the leaders of the Nazi party they'll know what I said about them being orientalists and that they had deep connections with Egypt and the Muslims so a lot of this is uh, you know is historical it's been out there and then the other point is key that most of the Western leaders now now there are some right wing leaders so that's starting to look good but on the whole, since the, after the Second World War, the, the leaders have been bought off by this Saudi money. And when you say Saudi money, that already is fairly erroneous. Right? The, the, these different groups go back to early secret societies uh, that are de in deep connection with the Jesuits and the Knights Templar tie-in. You know, as I say, as my work goes on, it they'll bring this all together. We can only talk about it briefly now. But you're quite right. The capsule to bring back from the East these Islamo-communists uh, and plant them in our society had to be done through the capsule of these mass invasions. Uh, uh, with those people coming across are the more sinister fifth columnists. Then so, you know, tomorrow when the rest are deported or just sent back, these guys will be left over. But they couldn't come in normally because then MI5 and other groups CC would know that they're there. The security forces would know they're there. But if you pour them in over the borders in the way that we are all too familiar with now, then there's really no tracking of them. They just disappear. And they are they have their friends waiting here, but those friends are white. Those friends are Western. That's why they'll never be discovered. And so there's certain thinkers on this who believe that there's nuclear weapons. It's like Fu Manchu, man. There's he, they've planted nuclear weapons in all the cities, London, Glasgow, Washington, New York. They've they've even found some. They even caught a couple of guys coming in who were dripping with with uh, radiation. In Kennedy Airport, right? So they knew that they had handled miniature which you can put in a suitcase. You can stick it in any airport, any train station, you know, anywhere in the world to threaten. And you can extort. They'll say that those weapons, just like some James Bond movie, they'll say, we planted these weapons, you'll never find them. Give us what we want. Give us diamonds in payment. Give us gold. You know, so we're gonna be, we're gonna head for serious trouble, but the, there's always been trouble in our world, but we'll always, the West can always overcome it with knowledge. So I'm a solution-oriented person. So as long as the knowledge is out there and that you know that you've got traitors in your midst, so I'm going to be telling the story of the traitors. And it goes back to, you know, a Jack Philby, a Ken, a, the famous Kim, Kim Philby, right, the, the communist uh, spy. His father was one of the most colorful cr characters in 20th century history. It goes back to him and it goes back to other people like that in British intelligence who sold out the West for this colossal oil money. And it goes back to Alan Dulles. And yeah, if, if, if somebody listening out there, the, the hairs are standing up the back of your neck, for good reason, right? The Dulles brothers are, are, are the prime movers. So there's a story to be told. 
And hopefully that story will explain modern times as well, you know, because it has to be current. So what it also does, though, is it exposes all of these lunatics in this movement running around with their pro-Palestinian act, with their anarchistic act, with their British imperialism down with act, you know, all of this nonsense. Uh, they, they have an agenda right out of the Red Book, you see. So they run around. Uh, India is full of these people because Islam, of course, is very strong in India. Uh, and so there's a whole story here that involves the Sikhs because the Sikhs are traditionally enemies of the Muslims and they should be fighting back, but they're not because they've been made into, there's a decadent, you know, the affluence and decadence. The Hindus should be fighting back, writing columns and creating blogs. They're not. So many of the traditional enemies of these groups are, are silent. And this is, of course, another great danger, you know, because groups who've traditionally fought the people I'm talking about are suddenly all quiescent. Is it because they're being silenced in the media or just because some other reason they're just not standing up anymore? They're too afraid or, or forgotten the lessons of history? I don't know, but it's not a good thing. Interesting. That's great. You know, I'm glad I haven't looked into it. Um, I, I like being surprised by kind of new ideas <laughs> and I have to look into that. It's really fascinating and it makes a lot of sense. And it's just another another tentacle of the monster, um, you know, which kind of makes sense, I suppose, when you start to join the dots. And, um, well, Michael, you know, I mean, I'd love to chat to you all day as usual, but I don't want to keep you too long because we're kind of running over. Um, but as always, you know, well, I can't wait till Sunday as well. That's going to be cool. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to that. It'd be nice to be on the other side for a change and be quizzed. <laughs> but um, well, anyway, as usual, Michael, thanks very much for your time. And again, you know, a little while, you know, I'll come up with another plan and cover some more topics maybe a bit further down the tracks. Oh, we will. We must do. This is ongoing. Uh, and there's so many tentacles to this. So I didn't even get a chance to talk to you about the Setians. Because when we talk about Atonists coming to Ireland, you know, under the guise of the Gales. There's a whole other connection there to the god Set, you know, in the hike sauce and a whole story we can get into there that, that, that impinges upon the coming of the sun worshippers, you know, to uh, to the West. So that we could probably get into that next time. But I'm really looking forward to our just interview on Sunday. Thank you very much for, for today, Emmett. Really appreciate it. No worries, Michael. Yeah, definitely. Well, what we'll do is we'll come up with a plan for the next one because I know, like, I hope you get a buzz off these interviews as well because talking about Ireland is something I know that you enjoy. And, you know, I know you've been quizzed for years about secret societies and other other subjects, but I think it's a nice buzz for you as well. It and it's also information that needs to be talked about. Um, as we've mentioned many times, Ireland is as good a, a study as any into why things are the way they are. And, I mean, God knows a people People in Ireland need it, you know, um, not just people in Ireland, but people around the world with Irish connections. But anyway, yeah, um, until Sunday, and uh, thanks for your time, Michael, and we'll chat again. Thank you, mate. Most welcome. Thanks for staying with Resolving Reality Radio. That was my interview with the veteran Irish author and researcher, Michael Desarian. And make sure to visit michaeldesarian.com for links to all of Michael's works and websites. That's Michael, T-S-A-R-I-O-N dot com. And especially visit irishoriginsofcivilization.com to study into the very important subjects of history and ancient civilizations, the origins of control and religion, secret societies, the human psyche, and other subjects as well. This is Resolving Reality. Don't forget to visit our website for all our articles, podcasts, and video content. Find our various social media and audio platforms and please do support and share our work by subscribing on our YouTube channel. Also, if you prefer high-quality listening and downloads, visit our SoundCloud profile, and the links for that, along with all our other links, is on the website resolvingreality.com. We'll be back soon with more video content and the next episode of Resolving Reality Radio. Until then, take care and enjoy Resolving Reality. You are listening to Resolving Reality Radio the podcast for Ireland's new independent media website, resolvingreality.com.